right, everyone, welcome to the Vantage Seminar. And this is our fourth talk on the series of Sato Tate Conjectures. And today, we're very happy to have David Zawina speaking about computing Sato Tate and monodromy groups. Uh, David, is it all right if we video this um, talk and put it on YouTube afterwards? That's fine. OK, welcome. Okay, so yeah, uh, thank you for you uh, having them. Am I muted? Okay, try again. I'm not muted now. Uh, <laughs> thanks for having me um, in this nice uh, lecture series. So uh, today is the fourth of them. And uh, today I want to describe the Sato Tate group, which somehow has yet to be defined in all the talks so far. And I want to describe a little bit about trying to compute them and why that's hard and interesting. So, so, uh, and uh, I'll try to remember the pause for questions, but please feel free to spam them in chat or just interrupt if you like. Okay, so um, we're gonna be talking about uh, just the abelian varieties today. Drew talks about some more general motivic things, but the abelian varieties is interesting enough. We'll think about uh, abelian varieties of a fixed dimension G defined over a number field and associated to each non-zero prime ideal of good reduction, we can define a Frobenius polynomial. And um, I don't really, oh, I gave a, def, I gave a description here, a characterization. It, it doesn't, that characterization doesn't matter. It's just the thing you need to know is it's an explicit polynomial with integer coefficients. Um, and for concreteness, since I'm actually interested in computing things, um, what's the input? You should think, if you want, you can just think of your abelian varieties given as the Jacobian, of a nice curve, smooth projective of genus greater than one. If you just want to think about genus four or five, you'll get the full scope of the, the lecture. Um, for primes of good reduction, this polynomial is just the reverse of the numerator of the zeta function at P. And so they are computable uh, by naive point counting, or as Drew said, some more uh, interesting techniques. So um, as input for the algorithm, which we'll eventually mention, think of just as a curve, and from that curve, you can compute poly Frobenius polynomials. And I will uh, recall Frobenius polynomials in a moment. So okay, that's the setup. Um, from V, we know that all these polynomials uh, have roots, the roots, complex roots, all have the same absolute value, square root of the norm of your prime. And so what we can do for the Sato Tate is we can normalize our polynomial. So we can, uh, scale the roots so they all have uh, absolute value one in C. And then we have this polynomial, its coefficients, as if we are bounded, independent of P, they're real numbers. And so we get this sort of re a sequence of real polynomials with bounded coefficients and you can ask about how they're distributed as you vary your prime P. And the Sato Tate conjecture, at least the uh, preliminary version, and I'll give a slightly more sophisticated and less shady version than this, says that as the prime P varies, these uh, normalized Frobenius polynomials, they should be distributed like the, character, the characteristic polynomial of some random matrix in a certain compact Lie group ST of A, where ST is gonna be stand for Sato Tate, and it'll be inside the USP 2G. So there is some compact group such that characteristic polynomials of a random matrix looks like the, uh, uh, the, a random normalized Frobenius polynomial. And so that's, that's the sort of the basic version of Sato Tate. And um, what I want to do today, and what's gonna take at least a third of the, the talk will be to define the Sato Tate group. And then I wanna start describing it. Okay, so or I think we should be okay on this. This is sort of the version of Sato Tate you've seen in the earlier lectures. Okay, so to define the Sato Tate group, uh, we're gonna approach it via elatic representations. So choose your favorite prime L, and then the abelian variety, you can look at its K bar points for some chosen algebraic closure of K. And it's an abelian group that comes with a Gawa action of the absolute Gawa group. Moving chat, distract, moving the, the names, it's distracting me. <laughs> so you have this abelian group of a Gawa action, 
And for our chosen prime, we could look at the ln torsion subgroup for increasing n. And this is a finite group of a gal action. In particular, it's a free uh, z mod ln module of rank 2g. And then we can package them together. We can take the inverse limit as we increase n, and that'll give us a zl module. And then we tensor up to ql, and then we get a nice 2g dimensional vector space over ql with a gal action. So we're this is our elatic realization here. We're taking the tape module, tensoring up to QL, and we have a GAWA representation. And I'm just gonna write it succinctly as rho L from the GAWA group of K to the QL automorphisms of our vector space VL. And on the right, I'm just gonna think of that as the QL points of an obvious algebraic group, which I'll denote GL sub VL, okay? And if and the last remark is just, if you want, you could choose a basis, but we're going to talk about the Mumford take conjecture later, and it's better to not choose a basis. Okay, so we have a fixed abelian variety for each prime L. We can construct a L-adic representation out of it of dimension 2G. Okay, so uh, let's next. And these representations actually encode the Frobenius polynomials. So if you have a prime of good reduction, not dividing L, the representation rho L obtained just by looking at the LN torsion points of your abelian variety actually knows that, represent, knows that polynomial. So your representation rho L is unramified at P. And so you can talk about rho L at for the Frobenius of your prime P, which is a well-defined conjugacy class in the GL VL. And its characteristic polynomial is exactly the Frobenius polynomial I mentioned at the beginning. And so, um, and if this, this is serves as a definition where you do need to do a little bit of work if this is your definition to check that its coefficients actually are integer and they are independent of L. Okay, okay. so these representations rho L, um, they know these Frobenius polynomials and conversely, the Frobenius polynomials know these representations rho L. Um, from faultings, we know that rho L is semi-simple. So from the Frobenius polynomials, we can actually recover the representation up to isomorphism. So it kind of works both ways. So again, this is on our route of trying to define a Sato Tate group, some explicit uh, Lie group that will fit into the Sato Tate conjecture. And so our approach is we're going to first consider a group for a fixed prime L. So uh, for a prime L, we have a representation rho L as we defined on the previous slide. And the l attic monodromy group of A, it's the Zariski closure of the representation rho L's image. So we have rho L, we look at its image inside this uh, QL, this algebraic group over QL, it's Zariski closure is this l attic monodromy group and it's a linear group over QL. And maybe just the property of why you might study them, um, we know from um, Bogomolov that the, uh, the group, the image of this representation actually is open in the, in the QL points of our group with respect to the l -adic topology. So knowing this one algebraic group, GL, you can recover the image of the representation up to commensurability. And this is, a good thing to do because the image seems like a scary thing to compute, but GL is a, it's an algebraic group. It's defined, cut out by equations. It doesn't seem as such a scary object, okay? So summary for each prime L, we made an l attic representation, its image, we take its risky closure, and that gives us this group GL. And so now we can define our Sato Tate group. There are different definitions of the Sato Tate group and they should all be equivalent under various conjectures. So this is just a convenient one. We have our abelian variety of a fixed dimension G over number field. We make a choice of a prime, choose your favorite prime, and we choose an embedding of QL into C. And we have our l monodromy group from the previous page, which we made using the LN torsion points. Um, that representation also, um, we can actually view GL inside see here, GL inside GSP. And that's because um, on VL, there's a, a pairing that coming from the VA pairing on the LN torsion points. 
and you choose a, por a polarization and you get a pairing. So GL is actually inside this smaller group. And then if we look at the subgroup that fixes the pairing, intersect it with the symplectic group, we get a subgroup GL1. And this one is really a normalization, which is going to play the same role as normalizing the roots by dividing by the square root of the norm of P. And then our Sato Tate group is we take this group GL1, we use our embedding I, so to go to QL to C points. And so now we have this uh, group over C, we can view it in the usual analytic topology. And then we can take, let the Sato Tate group be the ma A maximal compact subgroup. And that'll be well defined up to conjugation. Okay, and then we can, uh, yeah, and here I'm just saying that we can view the Sato Tate group as living inside USP, USP2G, which is just uh, the maximal subgroup of, of uh, the complex points of the symplectic part. Okay, so that, that's our Sato Tate group. This is the candidate for the Sato Tate conjecture. Um, no interruptions, so it's good. Um, so we've constructed this this group, this compact Lie group. Well, there is a there is a chat question, uh, David. Oh, oh, sorry. I'm. Ah, okay. Is the group GL independent of L? Um, maybe. <laughs> so we'll discuss that. Yeah. So there's maybe I'll go. Yeah. This definition is a little bit suspect, and the the, the problem is. I made a choice, I've made two choices. I've chosen a prime and I've chosen embedding. And then I said, here's the Sato Tate group. And yeah, the natural question is, does this group depend on the choices? And the answer is we don't know, but I'll state a conjecture which will imply that it's uh, independent of choices. But yeah, that's, like, that's the question you should ask. You should be very suspicious of these, these initial choices. I mean, that's the, that's the obvious question. Okay, so we have our group. Um, now we can sort of link it back to our, our primes. So if you take a prime of good reduction, uh, not dividing out, it'll maybe, yeah. And then what you can do is you can look at this matrix, which I, I called star. So what do we have here? Well, I have row L for Benius, which is a well-defined conjugacy class. You can give us a matrix with entries in QL. Then I use this random choice of embedding. Now it has entries in C. Um, I, and I normalize by dividing by the square root of NP. And this lives in this GL1 of C. Okay. And what you have is a semi-simple element of that group and its characteristic polynomial is exactly this normalized Frobenius polynomial from the beginning. Okay. And since the roots of this polynomial have absolute value one in C, it's going to, this element star is gonna lie inside a compact subgroup. And so in particular, we can find an element in a maximal compact subgroup that's conjugate to it. Okay, so for every prime P, uh, we can look at this construction here and find an element in the Sato Tate group which is conjugate to it. So that's, this is our, for each prime we have a element and this will be unique up to conjugacy. Okay, and then a more sophisticated version of the Sato Tate conjecture is that these conjugacy classes should be equidistributed inside the Sato Tate group uh, with respect to the Haar measure. Okay. And so let me just state the uh, uh, like a, a actual version with exact version and then I'll, I'll pause. So the same sentence, these conjugate classes I've made in the Sato Tate group um, should be equidistributed or equivalent version, just so it's, let's just say what an equidistributed means take any continuous function on the Sato Tate group. Um, central, meaning it doesn't care up to conjugacy what you have. So it makes sense to plug in conjugate classes into your function. And uh, then you take the primes of small norm, evaluate at your function at this conjugate class, and you average them. And this averaging process in the limit should agree with that integral. So these theta p's are actually sort of looking like they're hitting uh, Conjugate classes at random with respect to the Haar measure. And yeah, so here I'm just making it precise. And of course, the, uh, this, this would imply the, the looser version at the beginning that these normalized 
Verbenius polynomials are equidistributed, like the, tr the, the characteristic polynomial of a random matrix in some, uh, ST of A. Okay, so this might be a good place just to pause. I'll have a sip of coffee and see if there's questions. Teaching rocking chair. Nope. Okay, so this is the Sato Tate conjecture. Um, there's a few things suspicious about this description. Oh, sorry. Why is it? Um, well, yeah, so the. Allison asked the question. So um, this is well-defined conjugate class in GL1. Why is this a well-defined conjugate class in the Sato Tate group? And this is just a general principle of maximal compact subgroups. It's it's not a, I, I don't, I've, it's been a while since I've done that. And lots of books of cats have this. Basically, it's just a general fact about going from the algebraic group to the maximal compact that this is well-defined. Yeah, so it's, yeah, okay, my answer to that is just, yeah, it, it does work. This is well-defined conjugate class, but it, maybe it takes some thinking about. Um, oh yeah, so the suspicious things about this conjecture is that there's an L and an I floating in the background. One to define the group and the other to define the, the, the conjugate classes. So, and there might be some really bizarre world where this conjecture is true for one L and not for others. And there might be a bizarre world where different primes give you different groups, but the conjecture is still true for both primes. But uh, the belief, sort of the motivic belief is that the distribution I'm describing shouldn't depend on our choices. Okay, so I'll just move on. Um, yeah, let's just talk about some motives so I can show a picture of true. Um, so an example of a central function, the, the main example you should think about first is the trace. And the trace of our Theta p is just the sum of the roots of our uh, Frobenius polynomial normalized, or just uh, up to assign the, the first, uh, the, set, well, the second coefficient of our polynomial. And then we can talk about the, uh, the nth moment, which is this integral. And what Drew's done very well is he's actually computed this for lots of examples, computed these traces uh, for many primes. And as you do that for many primes, you can actually sort of make predictions on these moments, or you can sort of see what the moment should be. So here's an example. Um, my setup doesn't allow the animated pictures, but there's a link, click on them if you haven't. Just go away from my talk, look at the pictures, come back. Um, this is the example of a Jacobian of this specific curve over this specific field. And here's the histogram of these, uh, these traces of norm up to primes, norm up to two to the 30th. And I'm not sure you can tell, but if you're, if you're looking on them, if you're watching this on a mobile device, you might not see, but there are little spikes. This is data, it's not just a curve. But you can sort of see that the equidistribution taking over. And definitely look at Drew's uh, pictures and you can sort of see the equidistribution happening over time. And the moments, in fact, are always integers, and maybe it's too small to see, but the moments agree, but then as you sort of consider the moments to the right, they, they tend to disagree a little bit, which means you need more primes before you see the equidistribution take hold, and match them up exactly. Okay, and this is a lot of how, uh, well, I guess the, all the previous three speakers uh, have dealt with Sato Tate. If you have just a abelian variety and you want to recognize its Sato Tate group, you compute moments or you approximate them by computing a whole lot of Frobenius polynomials, and then you can match up which one you have. And then after that, you can try to prove it. And what I want to do today is at the end, describe how to get this curve, get these moments, but using very few primes. That's, that's the goal. Okay, so here's the problem. Uh, compute, predict the Sato Tate group of our abelian variety A. Um, for small dimensions up to three, they've been classified uh, in dimension two by these four authors. Um, in dimension three, by three of the authors, I, I don't know who to say to the genus one case, maybe Sato Tate, Sato and Tate, or maybe Sarah. 
um, when the dimension is three, their classification gives 410 possibilities of this group up to conjugation and 14 possibilities just for the identity component. And they're doing good work, but each dimension gets harder. And it turns out that dimension four, things will get a lot harder. Uh, when you have dimension four, um, the endomorphism ring of your Beeling variety no longer determines the group. So um, yeah, you up to dimension three, the, the, the Sato Tate group's just, if you know the endomorphism ring, you get the Sato Tate group. And also when you have dimension at least four, you no longer know the independence of your choices. Oops, I'm okay. okay, so that's the setup. We know what the Sato Tate group is. Um, from now on, I want to introduce a connectedness assumption. Um, this is gonna make things easier and it's, it's not gonna change the power of the theorems I have. Uh, so we're gonna assume all our l adic monodromy groups are connected. So again, the L-adic monodromy group is obtained by taking this risky closure of the, the image of row L. And Sarah says you can do this by extending the field by a finite amount. And in fact, once one of the groups becomes connected, they all become connected. Uh, or an equivalent assumption is let's just assume the Sato Tate group is connected. And that's gonna make things easier. And the theorems I have will still work for general abelian varieties, but it will only tell you about the identity component of the Sato Tate group. Okay, so I want to have a program which its input is an abelian variety, so you can just think of a curve, and that's, you can think of the Jacobian, but what is the output? How do you write down the Sato Tate group? Well, in this connected world, there is a sort of a nice way you should be able to write down the Sato Tate group. Um, from faulting, we know that the l adic monodromy groups are reductive. So we have a connected reductive group, and at least, well, if working over an algebraically closed field, um, it's completely determined by its root datum. So in the root datum, which I'll give you hints of later on, is just some combinatorial data associated to your group. It's you know, a free abelian group of a subset, another free abelian group of a subset with some properties that relate them. It's, it's stuff that a computer would be happy to output back to you. And the, uh, the natural representation of GL on VL up to isomorphism should come from weights with multiplicities, which again is sort of a combinatorial data. And so the Sato Tate group, you should be able to have a nice description of what it is because it's connected in terms of root data, which is describing the group, and weights, which is describing the map into USP 2G. And so that's kind of what I mean by compute. Uh, these are data which a program could output to you and you'd be sort of happy as opposed to equations defining GL inside some bigger space. And this data is really useful. For example, if you wanna compute the integrals showing up in the Sato Tate conjecture, uh, Viles integration formula is, it basically lets you write it in terms of your root data. So um, root data is a good way of describing it. And it's actually when you wanna compute the integrals that show up, it's the way you should do it. That's, this is what I mean by compute. And so now the idea, um, so that's, that's this is all the background. The idea is to look at your characteristic polynomial of Frobenius for a few primes and try to guess GL and hence the Sato Tate group. That's the, that's the idea. So maybe I'll pause for questions and just process if there's any questions in chat or just crosstalk. Yeah, semi-simplicity for abelian varieties is known, but in general, the tau cohomology, we don't know it. Okay. Okay, and so I'm a computational number theorist, but I'm not on the level Drew is. Few primes to me mean 100 primes. I'm not gonna compute trillions. So the idea is to kind of try to guess the group Sato Tate, but with a modest amount of primes. So here's the theorem, um, which I want to discuss. It's conditional on two conjectures, which I haven't mentioned, so we, I will get to them. But for now, I'll just take these two conjectures on faith. One's called the Mumford Tate group, um, and one other is called, I, it's a name I just made up just to give it a name, strong compatibility conjecture. Basically, the first one's going to tell us our Mumford Tate group 
doesn't depend on choices. The second one is that our conjugate classes are not going to depend on choices. Okay, so suppose these two black box conjectures. Then for most primes p and q, so in your ring of integers, take consider two primes. The Frobenius polynomial at p and the Frobenius polynomial of q will determine the Sato Tate group up to conjugacy. So um, what does this, so first of all, determine what does that mean? That's kind of how I described. It should be able to output uh, root data and weights enough to describe the group and the representation involved. You know, that's what determine is. And um, what does most mean? Maybe it's at the bottom here. Most is saying away from density, a zero set of primes. Um, so take P away from some set, set of density zero and take Q away from some set of density zero, which will necessarily depend on your initial choice of prime P. So choose a random prime P, choose a random prime Q, look at the Frobenius polynomials. And from those two Frobenius polynomials, I, and I'm assuming you made good choices, random choices, those two polynomials have enough information to compute the Sato Tate group. So that's the, the content of the theorem. And, uh, and again, this, this is also using our connectedness assumption. If you don't have connectedness, you might need more primes to figure out the identity component, but um, it's still okay. And kind of this stark thing about this is that two primes suffice. Um, so this is not equidistribution. Two primes are not telling you a lot of information in terms of the Sato Tate law, but it turns out those two, if you make good choice of primes, those two Frobenius polynomials are enough information to actually encode everything. Um, and also the thing I didn't say yet is that in fact, you can recover GL as an algebraic group over QL and its natural representation up to isomorphism, at least for L big enough. For all L, you can get them over QL bar, but for L big enough, you actually also get them over QL, the original base field. Um, so maybe this is another good point to just pause. Yeah. Have a sip of coffee. David, I have a question. Great, yep, Karam. Um, so, uh, so you're saying that if, the, if you assume the Sutter Tate group is connected, then two random primes will suffice. Yeah. Um, but if you don't a priori know it's connected, you still might want to compute the connected part. No, um, definitely. In that case, it's, is it, it's not clear that two primes of the, uh, sort of over the base field will be random right. or enough. Is that right? Yeah, so what you can do, and it's notation later on, so maybe it's unfair to answer this. You can look at the group generated by the, uh, for B, the, the roots of your Frobenius polynomial, say P, and if that's a free abelian group, then your prime will split completely in the field you had to go up to make things connected. So there is a, you could give me a bunch of primes and I can test whether they split completely in the field I have to extend to make all my uh, groups connected or not. So um, yeah, if you want a version without the connectedness assumption, you, two primes don't work, but um, I can test which ones I want and the ones that will work will be some positive density set I can compute. So it, it's, it is computable, it's just a more awkward statement. Great. Yeah, we can talk about it again after you get yeah. to the end of it. But it's also important because I actually don't really want to necessarily compute that field to go up because that takes some work. So this computes the connected component without actually knowing what that field is. Great, okay. thank you. So, yeah. so again, the stark contrast is these Frobenius polynomials should, when you normalize them, um, should be equidistributed, like the characteristic polynomial of a random element of the Sato Tate group. But I claim that just two of these polynomials allow you to recover the group, or at least the connected component. And that, that's, the, that's the talk, so that's. Can I ask a yep. question? Sure. So uh, in, from the statement here for the uh, two uh, Frobenius polynomials, two polynomials is it possible for from those two polynomials to uh, describe the root datum of this reductive group? Yeah, so the, the, the proof is going to be from those two polynomials construct root datum. Oh, well, that's great. Thank you. Okay. Um, yeah. 
Okay, same statement, but now there's different remarks at the bottom. Uh, the proof, I stated as a theorem, but the proof is actually algorithmic, which I've implemented. And um, in general, two primes, you know, if you make a bad choice of prime, then it doesn't work, or you get the wrong answer. So what you do is you just check a lot of primes. From a lot for me means 100, but uh, not a lot for other people. And if you think of sort of Shebatarif as giving you the randomness for the primes, um, what I have is basically a Monte Carlo algorithm. So the probability I give the wrong answer, assuming these conjectures, decays exponentially the number of primes I have. So as I check more and more primes, I become really confident in the, uh, the output I get. Um, yeah. Okay. Any other questions? This is good. Yeah, so it's actually an algorithm. Um, and actually, once I've made a choice of primes, everything else is deterministic. There's no more wiggle room. It's just choosing two good primes is the, the guesswork part. If you get a wrong answer, um, yeah, if you get a wrong answer, sometimes if you pick wrong primes, you just, the algorithm doesn't work because some things fail. You say there's no group with this root datum. This is illegal input. Um, do you get a smaller group? You will, I don't know if it, you will get a smaller group. Yeah, it's if you're wrong, the group you, and if you actually get an output which is valid root datum, the group you get will be smaller. Yeah. So it might output wrong data, but it's the wrong data is going to be smaller. That's how it works. But if you check enough primes, you should be confident. That's the, the emphasis. Okay, so um, maybe in a little aside, um, so you, this is talk four of a lecture series on Sado Tate, but what if you don't care about Sado Tate? Um, it turns out they're also interesting, it's kind of questions interesting geometrically. Oh, oh, hold on, Alison asked a question which I have to parse. If you get a wrong answer, is that answer? Oh, oh sorry, that's the same question, yeah. Um, okay, so this next part, you have, what does a prediction for GL give you? Well, a prediction for, if you predict what GL is, I can actually then compute the dimension of these um, cohomology groups. So here I'm doing a, a tau cohomology degree 2i of some, of some products of A. That, that doesn't really matter so much. A Tate twist, and then I take the Galois invariance. And the Tate conjecture says that this space is really interesting um, because it should be spanned by uh, cycles, by uh, sub-varieties of co-dimension i. And so, um, yeah, so making a prediction for GL is also kind of interesting because it's making a prediction on algebraic cycles of your abelian variety. And if you actually can find the existence of algebraic cycles that you predict, then you can actually sort of run through the algorithm and you should be able to, assuming these conjectures I assumed, which you can verify on the way, <laughs> prove the result unconditionally. Um, it's a little flippant to say if you find them. Finding algebraic cycles is a little bit difficult, and so you should sort of think of this theorem as another way of sort of saying predicting what algebraic cycles there are, but without actually bothering to try to hunt for them. And uh, since we're assuming the Mumford-Tate conjecture, Mumford-Tate conjecture implies Tate conjecture and Hodge conjecture are the same, so you also get uh, predictions on the dimension of Hodge classes. Okay, so this is sort of the geometric point of view. If you don't think Sado take groups but intrinsically aren't useful, it's a G, this method gives you a geometric prediction on dimensions of uh, these interesting classes of cycles. Okay. And again, this is just still in the, with this connected assumption, it's just two primes, two uh, primes and their Frobenius polynomials doing this. What is A to the J? A to the J is A, product with itself j times. Yeah. Okay, so the first thing is there's two conjectures. Let me just define them. Uh, the Mumford take conjecture. So we'll take an embedding of our k bar into C. And then we'll look at this uh, homology group where here I'm thinking of A of C with its usual topology. This is usual homology. And then the Mumford take group, which I won't really go into. 
it's, it's the actual definition is not needed for what I want to describe, but it's a group you construct, which is connected and reductive, and it's constructed using the uh, Hodge decomposition of H1. So the Hodge decomposition allows you to find this algebraic group, and um, it's, which is called the Mumford-Tate group. And then for each prime, we have a comparison isomorphism. And uh, we can view GQL, this is the Mumford-Tate group base change to QL, as a subgroup of this group we constructed before inside the acting on the, the Tate module. And the Mumford-Tate conjecture is that all these groups should match up. For each prime, the L-adic monodromy group should match the Mumford-Tate group base extended to QL. And so there's an earlier question, which has now gone off my screen. This is a strong version of saying that the GLs don't depend on L. They all come from a common group defined over Q. Yeah, so there's one, all the GL arise from a common group. And so if you believe this conjecture, you should just be uh, looking for the root data of G. And that's the same as finding the root data of any particular GL. Um, well, I have a remark here. Uh, which at the end, which is basically saying, yeah, this is a, and this will, this independence of L will let, will imply of the Mumford Tate conjecture definitely implies that the Sato Tate group doesn't depend on the choices. So our definition is independent of choices. And um, you can actually use Mumford Tate group, which this is only about the connected case, to actually show you have independence in the non connect, not, not necessarily connected case. Um, but here, G is not the Mumford-Tate group. You can use a motivic Gala group, which for abelian varieties is perfectly okay. And its connected component is the Mumford-Tate group. So uh, this is all connected, but the Mumford-Tate group will tell you in general that your Sato-Tate group is uh, well-defined, independent of choices. Okay, so any more questions? On can, I, can I ask a question? Of course. So uh, from this, um, Mumford Tate conjecture basically says that the GL is not only defined on QL, but also actually defined over Q. Because, yeah. Am I correct? Yes. Mm -hmm. It all comes, these all groups over QL all come from a common group over Q. Mm -hmm. So does the set, uh, a set of Tate group also, def is that also defined over Q? Well, it's a, it's a compact Lie group. It's, it's definitely a, a complex object. Okay, thank you. But you could take the, yeah. Okay. The second conjecture in the theorem is um, an independence of the conjugacy classes we had. So choose a prime, L, and embedding from before. Let's assume Mumford Tate's holds. Then if you have a prime ideal, not dividing L of good reduction, uh, you can look at this guy. So you have a, a matrix with QL entries. Uh, the embedding makes you allow it, you have a matrix with complex entries. And the Lumford Tate conjecture allows you to view that as an element, as a complex, as an element of G of C, which is this Lumford Tate group. And the strong compatibility conjecture, just the made up name, says that the constancy class you get doesn't depend on the choices. And when you normalize this, it's telling us that these constancy classes I made, which a priori depended on the choice of L and the embedding I, is well defined as well, independent of the choices. So. And so these two conjectures are reasonable if you're trying to compute set of take groups because you, you want to know there is a group with the right properties independent of L. Um, okay. And it's, it's, you, it's, I say strong compatibility. Usual compatibility is just the fact that this matrix here has usually has, char has characteristic polynomial of the Frobenius polynomial. So this is a stronger version. It's not saying that the characteristic polynomial is independent. It's that the, the Conzi class is independent. Okay, so these are my two conjectures. Um, let's keep moving. So let me try to start making root data. So a little side note, we're assuming the two conjectures from now on. So if you're trying to make root data of the Mumford take of any reduct connected reductive group, the first step is to choose a maximal torus. And so we're gonna take a random prime P and random means whatever I'm about to say is gonna work away from a set of density zero. And what we can do is we can have this random prime P and we can look at the subgroup, I'll call it XP, generated by the roots. So it's a finitely generated group in Q bar star. 
and it has a Galois action because the polynomial has integer coefficients. And um, if you, again, this is a this next statement holds for a random p. Uh, for random p, this group is going to be free abelian, a free abelian group with a Galois action. And if you know things about tori, this means it's going to come from a, a it's going to define a tori over torus over q. So there's a unique torus over q such that up to isomorphism such that the character group uh, is isomorphic to this group generated by the roots with compatible gala actions. Uh, is there a way of computing, giving the conjugacy class of Frobenius directly? Uh, I'm not sure. It seems, I'm not sure how to do it. Um, that would be nice, but. Um, okay, and so yeah, this, this group should usually be free abelian, it has a Galois action, and so that gives you a torus. So, uh, so when you work over Q bar, product of a bunch of GMs. And what you can actually do is you can TP and you can actually view it as a maximal torus of G. And this is a bit of a white lie. Um, it's actually a maximal torus in the quasi-split inner form. But uh, if you care about saddle take groups, you're going to extend everything to C eventually and it doesn't matter. But um, yeah, so this is how you construct the maximal torus. You um, choose a prime, look at the group generated by the roots with a Galois action, and that gives you a torus. And for people who don't know, well, for, when you have root data, the first ingredient of the root data is the character group of your torus. So that's, that's the setup. So that's the first part of root data, the character group of a fixed torus. And that's coming from your first prime. Um, oh, so let's do an example. So we have the Jacobian of this curve y squared equals x9 minus one over your field adjoined by adding the q, uh, adding the ninth roots of unity. And obviously the ninth roots of unity are needed to have all your uh, automorphisms of that curve defined. And actually that k is exactly the field you need to extend by to get your, uh, your monodromic groups to be connected. So that's that choice of k. Uh, genus four curve, so our Jacobian has dimension four. Uh, it's a CM abelian variety, and that actually means that the Mumford take group is a torus. And so a maximal torus of a torus is just the group itself. So for most primes, uh, this maximal torus will be the full group. And if you weren't given any more info, you might expect this group to have rank five. Just when you think about the roots of your polynomial with this obvious relation that the, the, the a root and its conjugate, the product is this fixed uh, integer. Uh, but when you actually do computations, uh, this TP or the, the group generated by the, the roots always has rank four or less. And so there's some unexpected relation in the roots of your Frobenius polynomials. And so that's, that's the next slide. So we have our curve um, and the Jacobian actually factors as a simple abelian variety of dimension three and elliptic curve. And so of course the Frobenius polynomials will factor accordingly. And I can actually write down the unexpected relation. You have this degree six polynomial and you can choose roots A, B, and C, three of those roots, such that the product times negative one and normalized actually gives you a root of the second polynomial. So it's this kind of weird thing where, and it's actually algorithmic. If you give me the Frobenius polynomial of B at P, I can look at it and I can construct the Frobenius polynomial of E at P. So that's kind of a strange world where the, for these polynomials coming from B will, you can produce the polynomials coming from E. Um, and it's, so this is our unexpected relation. And it's kind of weird. So somehow B knows the Frobenius polynomials of E. So in particular, it knows E up to isogeny. So given B, you know E up to isogeny, but the relation isn't obvious. E is not a quotient of B, which is simple. And the geometric explanation is that there, um, this abelian variety has an exceptional algebraic cycle. Uh, and this shrinks the monodromy groups and forces this extra constraint. That's, so this is the example where you do some computations and you just say, okay, um, things are smaller than I, I would 
at first think just by thinking about the endomorphisms, which means there's some interesting cycle. What this, this means isogeny. So yeah, if you want, you can use equality by just isogeny. Uh, David, there's several questions in the chat. Okay. Um, yeah, so the first one, this is isogeny. The second one, there's a property beyond the splitting. Yeah, there's a prop, there's some, yeah, there's some sort of cycle that's causing this strange connection. I, I don't want to say what the cycle is, but yeah, there's, it, this, this, this weird fact is not coming just from the, B is simple, so it shouldn't, doesn't have E as a factor, but somehow you still, it knows information about E. So it's kind of a, a bizarre thing. Um, anyway, that's, that's my example. Um, so I think I've answered my guest mentioned. Yeah, okay. People are answering questions then. Great. Okay, so what we've done so far is we've chosen a prime at random. It gives us essentially a maximal torus or how we're viewing it as a, the character group of that. Um, we need more information for root datum. So um, we have our random prime and we have our character group. The second information that we're going to construct is the vial group. For, yeah. And that's just um, abstractly, it's just um, for algebraic groups, it's the normalizer mod, the, the, the centralizer. And it turns out it's a nice finite group, which acts faithfully on our torus and in particular faithfully on the character group. Um, do I know what the Galois groups of those are? Not off, not off the top of my head. Um, Okay, so the, this vial group acts on the character on the on the, the characters of your torus, and here's where our second prime comes in. I've chosen p now. Here I get to make a choice of my auxiliary prime q. Um, for most p and q, uh, what you can do is you can look at L, the splitting field of this second polynomial, and you can look how it acts on the character group or this of the first polynomial or equivalently, it's just, it's concrete. It's just the group generated by the roots of the polynomial corresponding to P. And for most choices, the Galois group acts exactly as the vial group. Um, and so if you chose a random P and a random Q, the random P will give you the character group. The random Q would then give you the action of the vial group just by computing Galois groups involved. And um, yeah, this is a little bit tricky theorem. Uh, it's basically the kind of essence of uh, Galois group should be as big as possible. So here I'm kind of studying the Galois group of the Frobenius polynomials. And this is a version of it should be as big as possible. Um, and what's nice is that, so two choices, P and Q, one will give me the torus, the other one will give me the vial group. And so we have a maximal torus, we have a vial group. The last kind of major step is to find the roots. The roots is some finite set lying inside the character group. And once we have the character group, the vial group and the roots, um, you can actually recover the full root datum. Um, it's, it's from that information, that's enough. The vial group gives you extra information to get the co-roots. Um, and the actual representation involved, you just need to know the weights, but the weights are really actually easy. They're just coming from the roots of your polynomial and the multiplicity of the roots is giving you the multiplicity of the weights. So um, once we compute the roots, we can compute the full, we can compute the G up to isomorphism over C and it's embedding. And then from that information, get the Sadotate group. Um, maybe I'll, I think people are asking questions a lot, but I'll just pause for a moment anyway. Looks good. Okay. So finding roots, um, we have the weights of our representation. Um, and concretely, this is the group generated by the roots of the Frobenius polynomial at P. And this is the actual set of roots. Um, oh, let's waste it in the next bullet point. 
And the vial group was called W, is something you can compute from this second auxiliary prime Q. And um, you can break the weights up into orbits of the vial group. And I don't really want to get into this too much, but the roots you can show actually lie in some explicit finite set. It doesn't really matter the details, but this is some explicit set. So at least you have constraints on the set of roots. And um, now that it's inside an explicit set, you can compute, you just have to figure out what the actual roots are. And uh, the key input in this is, and this is really the, one of the big places I'm using abelian varieties, the rep irreducible representations involved are all minuscule. So there's a nice classification of them and I can sort of use those to help me. Okay, so there's three technical slides. I, I'll go through them fast. The main thing is that you should just get a feeling that the roots are computable. So the roots are gonna be in some explicit finite set. And then whatever the deal, I'm choosing an orbit of minimal cardinality. And then I'm making some set. I'm choosing another subset of them. That's the span of that and there. And then this set, I'm looking at this, I'm being very loose, but a span of there. And the, the point is you can find, okay, so the point is the roots are inside an explicit set. This is a, a algorithm that will give you a smaller set S1 and that smaller set will contain a unique irreducible component. And so you have this root system and this, is, this gives you a way to pick off one component so that and it, it, you know its rank. So the algorithm doesn't really matter. The point is you've sort of isolated one of the irreducible components, but you still don't know what it is. You just have a bigger set. Second technical slide is you can actually figure out the Lie type of this one uh, irreducible component directly. And that's just by knowing, knowing the, uh, the size of the vial group tells you most things. And there's one case you have to do work a little bit harder to separate them, but you've isolated an irreducible component then you can figure out its Lie type. And then the third technical slide is once you know its Lie type, you can actually describe that irreducible component exactly. And this is just, it, I'm not gonna read it. It's just, uh, it tells you how to figure out what the irreducible piece is. And then there's an inductive part where once you find one irreducible component, you take an orthogonal complement and you just iterate and you find all the irreducible components. Okay, so that's the technical slides. Basically, um, there's just an algorithm using the minuscule assumption of property that allows you to pick off the irreducible uh, components of the root system. So it's the main thing you should be able to do is this is computational. Okay, well that went pretty fast. And so now we have root data for G. Uh, we also have a Gawa action on all this root data. And that's actually not enough to recover G, but it is enough to recover a form of G, the inner, inner split, inner, sorry, quasi split inner form, G naught of G. And for L sufficiently large, um, these will agree when you base extend the QL. Sufficiently large just depends on the Mumford tape, which, which group it is. And in particular, since we're assuming um, the Mumford tape conjecture, for L big enough, this information will let you recover GL exactly. So that, that's, as I mentioned in the first theorem. So you can recover GL for L big enough. How big it is doesn't depend on the choice of P and Q, but it just depends on the unknown Mumford tape group. Let's finish with another example. Um, we have the Jacobian of this curve. We have a, again, over this field, the field's chosen to make all the groups connected. And then here I've chosen a prime, and I've chosen one that divides 109. Um, don't put much thought into that. It's, I think I just started at 100. Um, some of these uh, programs that compute these don't like small primes. So I think I'm just starting at 100. And that's the first one that was good for me. And that's the Frobenius polynomial. Um, you can choose roots of this polynomial, degree six, um, that represent kind of the, the conjugate pairs. So I'm choosing this representative. And actually you can choose them so that together they give you a character, the roots of a cubic polynomial whose coefficients are in this smaller field. So this is I'm just telling you what choice you can make. And then this group generated by the roots, all the six roots, turns out to be a free abelian group of rank four. There's no unexpected relations in the roots this time. 
And so it's generated by the three roots we chose and 109. And with this, we can sort of make a choice of basis. So we have view this as Z4. And so we have this explicit isomorphism. Uh, with respect to that, the roots are given by this set. And so we have the character group and the roots. Now we need to make a second choice of prime. I just chose the next one that worked for me, 127. And again, the group is also four. And now if I look at the splitting field of this polynomial and see what the Galois group of this over L is, this will give me my vial group if I've made a good choice. And with respect to the basis, it's exactly this. Um, of course, it's gonna fix 109, but it's also gonna permute the three roots, pi one, pi two, pi three. And I think what's going on is that L contains, uh, this L is containing that field we just saw earlier. And then you can run the algorithm, um, which I kind of flashed by already. You have two orbits and you find that the roots are inside this explicit finite set. And you can compute the Lie type and it turns out the, the roots are exactly that explicit finite set. You don't have to sieve anymore to see what it is. Okay, and so this is the summary of this example. We have our curve giving a Jacobian. We have the character group, the vial group, the roots, and the weights, and they all have multiplicity one. And together, that's enough to give you the Sato Tate group with its embedding. And if you just think about it a little bit, this is what it's describing. Okay, and this is exactly the graph we saw earlier we're coming from Drew's data. And from this, you can compute the moments, but to compute, and all you needed was two good, choos two good choices of primes, not uh, trillions. Okay, so some conclusions. Uh, the pros of what I've described, you don't need as many primes. And this is really helpful because in high, high dimension, computing, prime, computing for uh, Fibrini's polynomials is expensive. So you don't, wanna you don't want to have to use many primes. Um, it, doesn't also, it also doesn't require a classification. So you don't have to know um, everything. So the, the load the dimension stuff has been classified. So you find out what all the possible Sato Tate groups are. And then if you have an abelian variety, you can recognize which one it is by using the classification. And here there's no classification involved. And so in particular, you can go off the high dimensions where the classification is gonna take generations to get there. Um, the root data is concise, it's useful to work with. The big con is I only have, at this point, have control over the identity component of my cytotate group. I don't get the full group, but it's, it's, it's good information. And then the last thing is kind of, kind of like putting out my hat at the end of the talk here. I would like examples. So I have this method, which is useful for computing cytotate groups or a different ver way to view it as algebraic cycles. Um, if you happen to have abelian varieties lying around, which you think might have interesting geometry, interesting cycles, let me know. I'd like to compute them. Send me an, send me an equation or send me some polynomials and I'd be happy to see what there is. Um, uh, we have dimension three up unlocked, but dimension four and higher is really mysterious. And it's kind of int be interesting to see what we could find. Okay, so thanks. Thank you so much, David. Um, the next talk will be May 19th by Alina Bakur about effective Sato Tate. And now we have time for some additional questions. Using more primes, I'm, so Edgar asked, using more than two primes, can't you deduce that? Out? And I'm kind of, I mean, I can always have more primes. Is that, what's the I issue, think, Edgar? I, mean, I think the question is to, 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 to compute the whole group, not just the connected part. 
Yes. Oh, uh, oh, I, I need, I need more primes. I mean. Sure, you need more primes, but you should be able to compute. Yeah, I mean, two primes are not in it. Like, if you give me a group and I have two conjugate classes, I can't really figure out what the group is. Like, it's, it's really and now I'm describing a finite group, and that needs a, more information than just two primes. Sure, Think about computing so. finite Galois groups. You need to compute your, your for. For Benia's kanji classes for several primes before you can figure out what it is. So I don't think two primes is going to be enough to get the full Sato Tate group. Oh, I agree with you. So my thing is that my claim is that if you understand a group of uh, group of connected components, that gives you a bound on mm -hmm. number of primes that you need to figure out the full Sato Tate group. Yeah, yeah, that would be true. And you actually know the primes that are ramified, so you actually have pretty good control over what that field could be. Okay, thank you. Oh, and maybe I should say one thing. Those except most, I can't make most explicit in my theorem because to make it explicit, I have to use Shebatarov and then I have to use the images coming from the Galois representations. And then to study the Galois representations, it seems like the first step is to compute the Aladic monodromy groups and then it becomes kind of a circular <laughs> study. So. In my fear, most I can't really make explicit. That's kind of um. so if you look at, uh, this is Rachel. Yeah. If you look at cyclic covers of P1 branched at three points. Yeah. Uh, is it known uh, in general when you might get these exceptional algebraic cycles? I, I, I don't really know the, the full theory of these cycles. Um, yeah. I, I'm, I'm just coming out of the low dimension world right now. So it's kind of, <laughs> I'm not sure exactly when cycles. These, um, we have pretty good control over cycles in the CM case. It's the non, yeah, I'm not, I'm not quite sure. I don't have anything intelligent to say, sorry. Um, yeah, and there's a question in chat. I don't really have, I don't really know what the cycle is. I, I've not worked out the cycle. I just know there is one, but I haven't actually worked it out. Have you looked at the um, other example I think Shiota gives y squared equals x to the 15 minus one? Yeah, I can do, I can do all of those for the connected components. I think I went up to like 25 or something. So yeah, all those Shioto examples, which give lots of, their CM abelian varieties with lots of interesting algebraic cycles. Yeah, I can, I can work. I mean, my algorithm just will work on them. I'm not sure if I have. Yeah, I was just wondering if, if you find anything different or, or are they all similar to the, the example you gave? No, but sometimes you have a lot more cycles than others. It varies a lot by which, which curve you choose. Um, I really want to get into some non-CM yeah. examples, yeah. Thank you. Uh, can I ask a question? So uh, earlier you described how to compute the uh, components of the inductive group, uh, GL, and you saw, noticed that you listed the, all the type A, B, C, or the classical types. Have you seen right. any exceptional uh, so, components um, appears? Where'd it go? Yeah, yes, so, this uh, is the part. Mm -hmm. Yeah, there's a theorem of Sayre which says that the exceptional lead type shouldn't show up. Shouldn't. So for a Mumford Tate group, there are no exceptional lead types. So if I see exceptional lead types, it means I did something wrong or I disproved Mumford Tate, right? There, it's, it's so, in, um, and I have code which, yeah, so you shouldn't see any exceptional types. Okay. So this is a complete list. There are no exceptional types that should be found. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Oh, this this I have a re possibly related question. So you mentioned uh, maybe some of you earlier that because we're talking about abelian varieties, you you only have you only encounter minuscule uh, co-characters. Um, yeah. Um, so first of all, is that related to the fact that you don't get exceptional types? Um, that, that's very much the reason why you don't get exceptional types. Okay, so then the follow-up question is, if we're not, if we weren't talking about abelian varieties, say we're talking about some other motive. Um, yeah. Okay, other issues like not knowing semi-simplicity and so on, but just from the point of view of 
you know, a situation where you like Edgar suggests free services, although, um, I, I, but let's, let's imagine you're in some case where you could get a non minuscule uh, yeah. character. Does that cause some serious conceptual problem with your algorithm or is that just a technical issue that you have to do more sophisticated Lee theory? To do yeah, it? so it's just, I have to do more Lee theory. Um, every, I think I haven't gone through, but I think if I go through my entire proof and assume all the motivic things in that article of Sarah you mentioned in your talk, um, I think everything goes through except this uh, minuscule assumption, which I'm just doing as a, an easy way of picking out the root, root system. I think some more complicated uh, Lee theory would allow you to do this sort of in general motives, but of course with a lot more conjectures at the beginning. Of course. All right, well, thanks so much, everybody. Um, and we'll meet again on May 19th with Alina Bakur. Have a great day.